I'm speaking with editors Martin Kirby and Margaret Baguli about their book, The Palgrave Handbook of Artistic and Cultural Response to War Since 1914, The British Isles, The United States, and Australasia. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having us. We're really excited to talk about the book. So tell me first, uh, each of you, how did you get into studying and writing this particular on this particular subject? Well, for me, it was a, uh, a childhood link, really. Uh, my father was a cyclist, and um, he used to race on Saturday afternoons. And every Saturday morning while preparing to go, he'd watch uh, the final battle scene from the 1964 movie Zulu. Hmm which has been rightly described as Stanley Baker's love letter to Wales. And it, it tells the story of the, the 1879 battle between 150 British soldiers and 4,000 Zulus. And he'd always watched the final scene where the Welsh soldiers sang Men of Harlech mm -hmm. and the Zulus sang their war chant. And it's this epic moment. And I think he used to watch it to, to G himself up mm -hmm. uh, for, 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 for the road race in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And to me, that 1964 movie became what the battle at Rourke Street was about historically. Mm -hmm. So when I visited Rourke Street in 2000 uh, in Natal in South Africa, I didn't visit an historical spot where I tried to imagine what, imagine what happened in 1879. What I was doing was engaging with it through Stanley Baker's lens in 1964. Uh, Men of Harlech was not sung at the battle. Uh, the regiment only became a Welsh regiment a couple of years after the battle. The majority of the soldiers were English. Mm. So I was responding to it as a cultural artifact, not as an historical event. Mm -hmm. And and to me, I think that was a childhood exposure to the notion of historical truth and, and from there, artistic and cultural responses to conflict. Mm. That for me... Rourke's Drift 1879 is really Stanley Baker, British movie 1964. Mm. And that's something that, that we engage with in, in the editing of the book, mm. where you're dealing with um, people's perceptions of conflict and their perceptions are based on other people's perceptions, which are then based on other people's perceptions again. Mm. So um, that was perhaps the one of the, the seminal moments that, that drew me to this kind of... Um, exploration and the other was I, I found a book on my grandmother's shelf when I was 12 years old and it was called Realities of War which for those who know my grandmother is a very odd title for a book to be on her shelf mm. she was a very gentle and quiet woman mm -hmm. but it was written by Sir Philip Gibbs one of the most famous English war correspondents of the First World War and I read it as historical truth uh, and over time I, I came to understand that that he was a journalist that he was a middle-aged man uh, born in the Victorian era with uh, certain qualities of temperament and outlook that shaped what he wrote. And, of course, overlaid on that is the censorship regime that he worked under. Hmm. And years later, after carrying that book around with me for many years, I used to read it while supervising exams at school as a teacher. Uh, my first PhD was A Life of Philip Gibbs. Hmm. So my exposure was through those two childhood moments where I understood that that my understanding of conflict, of war and of art, is refracted through a, a prism that it, it has been shaped by um, numerous artists and writers and poets. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll, I'll pass over to my colleague uh, uh, Margaret now for uh, to give her a chance to talk. Okay. Thanks, Martin, and thanks, Chris, for having us on, on your show too. Um, I grew up in a country town called Warwick, which is in Queensland, and quite a rural place. And so, of course, Anzac Day, which is what we celebrate in Australia with Australia and New Zealand, um, is a really significant event in country towns. And pretty much every family was affected. So I grew up with the stories of family members and what had happened and, and that legacy that had come down of... Um, that service and sacrifice, and, and that was the really important part of, of, you know, country town life as well. So when I left school, I enrolled in a Diploma of Creative Arts and um, learned all the studio discipline areas, but had the chance to go and visit the Queensland Art Gallery, which is just the most amazing 
institution and has some really beautiful artworks in there. And I was very struck by the artworks that were in there that were related to war and conflict and suffering um, across a range of different areas. And I remember thinking that that really resonant and emotional impact that an artwork has is so important because artists can sometimes bring to light what can't be said and can sometimes shine a light on aspects of war and conflict that that are difficult to articulate. Mm. So after that, um, I was very fortunate to travel on my honeymoon of all places through the battlefields because <laughs> you, that's what you do. And, <laughs> and it really struck home to me the importance of place, the importance of event, and to actually be in these places where where the artists had drawn their experiences from, to actually be in these places and understand and look at them and to see the green rolling hills, you know, the scarred earth that had been covered by calmness now, but understanding what had happened there before. So so it, it really struck me how important these artworks actually are as, as ways of... of telling people and, and explaining to people what had happened and and of course when you think of art and, and the way that art has been um, used to teach people certain things through time, mm-hmm. it makes perfect sense. So I had that really wonderful experience and, and that immersion and also that, that, that sense of, you know, this is a really significant thing that's happened. So then to go into major galleries overseas and to see because I thought the Queensland Art Gallery was pretty good, but there's nothing compared to the National Gallery and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and all of those places, which have just stunning, stunning artworks. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I was fortunate enough to work with Martin, so his passion for history and my passion for art and Janet's passion for drama mm-hmm. all came together. Mm-hmm. And Martin and I have been really fortunate in having secured a few... Um, grants as well Mm. that brings history and art together so they've been ostensibly for the commemoration cycle but we took a different approach in that instead of looking at um, you know renewing an honour board or cleaning a memorial we decided to bring together the arts and history in really interesting ways so we secured a federal grant for an arts and culture um, event where we use the um, the buildings at St. Joseph's Nudgee College, which is where Martin used to teach, Mm -hmm. and we projected onto the walls the history of the boys who'd gone to war because his school was built in 1891, so quite Mm -hmm. old for us, not Mm -hmm. not so old for other places. Mm -hmm. But it was really wonderful to actually use the buildings to tell the story. So those sorts of things, and we had a few Queensland grants as well, with the art. So we've just, having kind of got that track record happening, then we decided, well, look, we think we have some really great things to say and we know some really important people that could contribute to this handbook. So it's sort of, it's one of those wonderful synergistic strands that all came together for us Mm -hmm. and, um, and for our passions to come together too. So I do have some questions. I'll, I'll note that one of the purposes of this podcast is to explore people's perception of war and um, both to see how they perceive war and also to correct uh, misunderstandings. You know, I, I, I tend towards more academic looks at military history uh, rather than, um, say, pop history, for lack of a better word. Um, and I'll, I'll also mention to my listeners, Janet McDonald is another editor on the book. She just couldn't be here on this call. So before I ask my questions, uh, tell me tell me more about this book what you explore, themes, and that sort of thing. Well, uh, the book began um, perhaps more humbly than it, uh, than it eventually finished because it, it began as uh, a, a ten-chapter work looking primarily at Australian responses uh, to conflict, uh, artistic and cultural responses to conflict. But uh, having worked with Palgrave Macmillan, and, and they've been wonderful, uh, they said the ideas are great, but, but they wanted us to expand on them, uh, to take in... Um, uh, other cultures, uh, other national experiences. So what we've got now, and it's, it's coming out at the end of the year, it's, it's 30 chapters, and it looks at um, uh, the British Isles, uh, the United States, and, and Australasia. So, for example, 
uh, we've got a range of chapters on official art. Hmm. So we've got uh, Claire Bernard and Alex Walton, who are curators at the Imperial War Museum, looking at World War II and World War I official art, uh, respectively. We have Paul Goff here in Australia looking at uh, the Falklands War and the official artists who went there. We have Kit Messon-Muir, who's looking at the War on Terror, as is Michael Armstrong and Charles Green and Little Brown, who were Australian official artists. So they're looking at the role of official art yeah, and official artists in interpreting war. Because, of course, in Australia today, the, the vast majority of us have no direct um, it, um, connection with war or experience of it. So by its very nature, we are compelled to view it through the eyes of, of other people. Uh, we've looked at, uh, say, Susan Santoli, um, who works uh, at the University of Alabama. You were saying you were from Miami originally, so perhaps a little bit uh, further down your way, closer to you certainly than us. Mm -hmm. Looked at textbooks in Russia, the U.S., uh, Russia, U.S. and uh, Germany, uh, straight after the fall of the Berlin Wall looking at the way history textbooks had to be updated almost as the history was occurring. Mm. Uh, we have Christine now who's looking at the Korean War Memorial in Washington. Uh, Carol and Winter, an academic here in Australia, is looking at the uh, Michelin tour guides that emerged after 1918 as people began to revisit the battlefields. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at a whole range of unofficial responses as well. A fascinating one is by uh, an American academic, Inga Meyer, who's looking at 9-11, the war on terror, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm. I'm not a superhero movie uh, kind of guy, but, but I enjoy the Avengers movies. But she looked at the way, um, well, pop culture, for, for one way of describing it, uh, has looked to deal with the changing uh, landscape uh, since those, um, those terrible events uh, on 9-11. We've got a, a, an academic we work with at the University of Southern Queensland, uh, Daniel Maddock, who's writing on Saving Private, Saving Private Ryan. Mm. And the way that that's recognised widely as the most accurate, and I know this is only sound, not vision, but I'm doing airborne inverted commas. It's the most accurate war movie of all time. But in fact, it's distilled through Robert Kappa's images of, of the landing on Omaha Beach uh, and John Huston's almost pseudo-documentary, The Battle of San Pietro, mm. uh, released in 1945. Mm. Uh, we have John Harris, another uh, American academic, whose chapter looks at the, the three, well, three of the famous photographs from the Vietnam War, uh, the, the burning monk, the napalm attack, and then the street execution mm -hmm. in, in Saigon. Uh, we've got Jeanette Fresne, who's in Texas, uh, the Stamps Backs, the GI School of Music, looking at the GI Bill and, and the opportunities American uh, ex-servicemen had to be educated. So there's this, and um, one more, uh, uh, well, certainly there's probably a few more, but there's an excellent chapter by a UK academic, Martin Malone, looking at Irish soldier poets mm -hmm. and another on the 50th anniversary of World War One. So there's this whole range of um, explorations of artistic responses to conflict. Uh, Natasha Silk at the University of Kent is exploring uh, British soldiers' response to bereavement on the Somme. Mm -hmm. And there's this wonderful description at the end of the Battle of the Somme, which is before American involvement in the war. Uh, the British Army lost 57,500 men in one day. 20,000 of them were killed, which makes it the worst day in British military history. Mm -hmm. And she describes the battalions at a church parade after the battle with the colonels standing in front of the remnants of their battalions, um, some incredible number of them lost over 50% of their number. Mm -hmm. And the colonels were in front of the, the remnants, crying. And there's this her exploration of bereavement. Others have looked at small communities, such as Stephen Roberts. Um, other writers, such as uh, Alice Brumby, has uh, looked at hospital magazines, semi-official responses to conflict. So it's a, it's a broad range of explorations of very famous uh, responses to conflict, um, say Australian official art, it's, it's famous to us, or, or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, mm -hmm. and then things like, uh, lesser known things like the, the hospital magazines, um, uh, like, um, for example, there's another chapter by a man called Ian Donald who's looking at games and digital technology as part of the Great War Dundee project. 
Mm -hmm. Paul Duncan wrote a, a wonderful chapter on Megan Levy, the movie, looking at the way American entertainment, which though it might ostensibly look anti-war, is in fact, um, the movies tend to support American uh, involvement in the war on terror. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've run through a lot of the chapters there, but it, to give you a sense just of the breadth of it, that notion of what is the nature of, of combat and of war, mm -hmm. and the way artists have traditionally uh, tried to um, explore and explain uh, the nature of war. Mm -hmm. And for Australians, of course, it's particularly important, well, I suppose, um, to be fair, it's important to any society that's involved. But we became a nation in 1901. We federated, and it was essentially through an act of British Parliament. We voted as a people in a referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have an American Revolution as our foundation moment. We don't have a civil war. We have the frontier wars with our indigenous populations, but that's the great silence in Australian history. Mm -hmm. It's it's been airbrushed out, and that's something we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. So World War One for us is our foundation myth. The national mythology is drawn from 1914-18, and and much of our history after it, and it's both a good and a bad thing, is viewed through that prism that Australia somehow became a nation in 1915 when Australian troops landed on Gallipoli. Mm -hmm. And there's been since that day a militarisation of Australian history. Uh, for the Brits, for example, uh, and for the European nations involved, World War I was this destructive uh, experience that, that shattered the foundations of society and then led to the end of monarchies. In Australia, though, we suffered 60,000 casualties, which is an enormous number for our population mm -hmm. of just over 4 million at the time. It was about growth. It was about birth. It, it, it became an epiphany that we were a nation. Mm -hmm. um, to compare the two responses is the difference between an epiphany and a breakdown. So that's essentially uh, how I've become involved. I'll, I'll pass again to my colleague, Margaret, to, 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 to stop me talking just momentarily. <laughs> Oh, no, Mark, you're wonderful. <laughs> and that's not a paid advertisement either. That's a, a sincere and, and, and honest appraisal. No, Martin's our military history person, so he's been just fantastic with bringing all this together. And his, oh, uh, knowledge, <laughs> his knowledge is extensive. So you didn't have much more to add, Margaret? Oh, just that the authors, I've really enjoyed working with all the authors and mm. I think that anyone who, who reads the book will be just fascinated by by the events that are being described and, and things that aren't as well known as Martin said, mm -hmm. but that really interesting perspective that people have because I suppose now, you know, there is a time for reflection. It's the centenary of all of these events. So there is that, we do have a pause point now, but at the time, seeing that very raw emotion coming through that people are reflecting on now, I think is, is a, it's a really significant opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And I think as Australian um, authors too, it, you know, we can be a little bit isolated from things. And I, I just love the fact I, I've learned so much through this book, mm -hmm. learned so much about what's happened around the world. So. Yeah, because of, oh, sorry, go on. No, you're right. It's, it's been a, a fascinating project. Because, of course, the Australian government has spent close to half a billion dollars on centenary commemorations in the four years. It's been rightly described by Jean Beaumont, one of our historians, as, as an orgy of commemoration. Mm -hmm. I think we've spent, we've spent more per capita uh, soldier involved than pretty much all of the other combatants put together. It, it's such a central part of national identity and it's and it's a nice reminder to read chapters uh, that remind us of course that it was a world war mm -hmm. and that you, you so there's some wonderful chapters by, by people like Fraser Brown and William Kennefick who've looked at the Scottish experience in World War um, in World War One mm -hmm. or Gethin Matthews who's who's looked at uh, the Welsh experience and in fact when he started talking about the impact on Wales I had to go to Professor Google to find out hmm. um, what casualties uh, the Welsh stood during the war because so often they're subsumed under uh, United Kingdom mm -hmm. or Britain and Empire. And it, it was a nice reminder, of course, that though it was a central moment for my nation, for our nation, mm -hmm. uh, certainly it was a world conflict and it's, 
and its repercussions are, are still being felt to this day. I believe it was only a few years ago that Britain paid off the First World War, mm-hmm. that it had cost them so much they'd only just recently met their financial debts. And, of course, with imperial war graves or Commonwealth war graves ringing the earth, mm-hmm. um, the Australian government is still paying because uh, there's... Uh, 100,000 or, or close to 100,000 across all conflicts, um, the majority of whom are buried overseas in Commonwealth War grave cemeteries. Hmm. So it's the, the cost is, is certainly still being felt. And uh, having gone to school assemblies, for Anzac Day commemoration assemblies on April 25th, we will invite uh, a veteran of the uh, war in Afghanistan to speak. Hmm. And he'll stand behind the microphone and will listen intently, and he will start his speech with, on April 25th, 1915, Australian soldiers landed on the shores of Gallipoli. Mm. So pervasive is the Anzac mythology, which is Australian-New Zealand Army Corps, Mm. and it became a generic title for for Australian troops and New Zealand troops, that even when an Afghan veteran stands up, he still finds himself uh, dealing with his experience through... um, Again, the prism of a, of a century of artistic and cultural responses to war. Mm-hmm. There's just one point I wanted to pick up on what Martin said with people not having direct engagement in the book, but we do have Major Michael Armstrong, who um, who has been in the Army since 1998, and he's had four operational tours of Timor, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, um, and he was in the counterterrorism unit over there so he he's an amazing person but he was very worried about bringing his artwork and his military experience together so he has looked at that experience as being a a soldier and an artist and and he was actually trying to complete his studies while he was in afghanistan so the university had to he wasn't allowed to use the internet of course so they had to send packages to him and Mm -hmm. but he managed to do it which was great and also Charles Green and Lyndall Brown, who are official war artists, hmm. um, you know, they're kept at a distance, but they did see quite a lot of um, activity there as well. So, mm-hmm. And there's yeah. that wonderful description of theirs when they arrive at the, the massive American air base, where they get a tour of it, where the driver unofficially takes them past. They set this almost endless roll, uh, row of American military aircraft. Mm. The language they used to describe it, this this sense of imperial power mm. in Afghanistan, where of course the uh, the Brits and the Russians have also uh, sure. traditionally had their struggles. Uh, so they're yeah. making those historical connections again. Mm-hmm. Uh, was of course uh, you know a, a fascinating part of the project. Mm-hmm. So, considering all the different um, types of of artwork and and. Um, however you might want to call this collected um, uh, information, say. Uh, how, how does it, can, do you have relative ratios as far as what celebrates war, what condemns war, and what maybe is just a neutral look at it? Are you able to break that down or get some sense, even across time, across the century? Well, well there's three major sections, which Martin might talk about in a minute, that it's broken down into. So the first one is loss, grief and resilience, mm-hmm. and then the second is identity, and the third is commemoration. So I know what you're saying there, because when we had the chapters, we were going, okay, so because when you're doing an edited book, you, you have to try and get the interest from authors and see who's out there and who can write and all sorts of things like that. So once they started to come in and we were going, okay, we would like to do this and this, but let's look at the major groupings that we've got. Mm-hmm. So they were the three major sections, but I think Martin can talk to the next part of your question. Mm-hmm. Well, um, essentially when we talk about neutral responses, I mean, that's a... Um, uh, that certainly didn't happen. Uh, because we looked primarily at 20th century, co- well, we looked at 20th century conflict, hmm. uh, there were few um, overtly um, militaristic artworks or, or, or cultural responses that we looked at, uh, although that doesn't mean that they didn't perform that pattern. Hmm. Because if we look at the Australian experience, the Australian soldier during World War One was was initially celebrated as a national archetype, you know, the warrior. Mm. Um, he was uh, egalitarian in outlook, valued mateship as a sect. 
particular religion, um, did not deal well with, with officialdom, was something of a rebel. Uh, it's the way Australians will want to see themselves. Mm -hmm. But over the years, though our fidelity to that, to that national archetype has remained virtually unchallenged, it would end a politician's career to really question it. Mm -hmm. uh, it has evolved through the 90s, 1960s and 70s, through the era of the Vietnam War and the counterculture, there emerged a, a softer, gentler view of the Anzac, uh, who spoke to the to the national to the to the modern concept of of trauma and of suffering. Mm -hmm. So we've we've now looked at the um, the soldier not as the the warrior, and of course most of the Australian soldiers during World War One were infantry and artillery, uh, so they were at what we would call the sharp end. I mean, they had to kill or, or, or be killed in, in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. But uh, that view has evolved over the years that we now look at, at, at trauma and, and suffering as central to that. We see the Australian soldier as a victim of wars. And being a smaller country, we have the, um, I won't call it dishonest, but we have the luxury of, of not necessarily having to question the major direction of the war. We don't have to criticise Australian soldiers for being involved in World War I or in Vietnam because mm -hmm. we fought as junior partners of the empire and, uh, of course, as an American ally. And that's a cop-out, of course, for some reason. Our troops were committed and as a nation we must accept our responsibility. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is that though we don't glorify war as in a, like in a Tennyson where uh, and Alfred Lord Tennyson with the charge of the light brigade, you know, cannons to the left of them, cannons to the right of them, cannons in front of them, Mm. And my onward rides the brave 600. What happens is that myth of the war writers have called it, uh, like, um, for example, Samuel Hines you know, was one of the authors who's used that term in his wonderful book, A War Imagined, mm. that it became the myth of the war, which is uh, uh, idealistic soldiers join up in 1914, dash to war to see it over by Christmas, and are betrayed by generals who don't know what they're doing. They die in meaningless frontal attacks on barbed wire and machine guns. They emerge, those who survive, as shell-shocked victims who then lead us into a period of disenchantment during the 20s and 30s. That becomes a, a myth of the war, mm -hmm. and that becomes the new glorification of war, where instead of saying war is um, glorious, which is a, a, you know, a shallow, you know, very one-dimensional view, We've almost replaced that shallow view or that, that myth with another myth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Blackadder series at, um, mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Yes. Uh, it's taught in schools, as, uh, not as uh, a 19, late 1980s view of World War I. It's offered as historical evidence of the views held by people during World War I. Mm -hmm. And we see the great war poets um, like Wilfred Owen, like Siegfried Sassoon, where they are representative of a particular part of a culture. Um, not every frontline soldier went to war with a, a poetry book in his pocket. Mm -hmm. So they speak for the intelligentsia almost, the, the educated elite. Right. And that was not necessarily consistent with uh, the wider views. So in a very long answer to what was a very short question, mm -hmm. we've certainly uh, looked at... Uh, uh, a, a range of artworks and of cultural responses. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't necessarily any overt militaristic uh, uh, exploration of material. Uh, most of it, in some level, either questioned the war or um, saw it as, a, as, a, as an, if not a necessary evil, but, a, but as something Britain had to do, for example. Britain had to go to war to defend little Belgium or it would lose all honour. Mm -hmm. uh, Australia had to go because we were part of the empire. Uh, we considered ourselves British. Um, so our, our explorations in that sense looked at the way people tried to balance that. Uh, one of the chapters Margaret and I worked on was a, uh, a look at the war correspondence of Philip Gibbs on the Western Front in World War One. Mm -hmm. And he didn't write that war is a glorious thing. He wrote that it was terrible. But he didn't question the war as such. Mm -hmm. he, he might say it's terrible, but he talked about the British soldier being incredibly courageous and always joking and laughing as, he, as they went over the top, um, you know, for, for empire. 
Mm. So there's certainly a breadth of things we've looked at, but what is fascinating is that that each person, or each culture, um, are victims of time and place. They they bring to it their own temperament and their own background, and they try to make sense of what is happening in front of them mm. uh, at the time. And there's a, a sense that they're updated over time. One would only need to look at uh, the legend of King Arthur and the way societies have adapted that, where we see um, uh, it's celebrated in the 19th century as chivalry being a almost a, a code for the British gentleman. Mm-hmm. And we see Camelot in the 60s, you know, with that link, of course, with Kennedy and the Kennedy administration, a new mm-hmm. Camelot mm-hmm. helped by the musical. And then we see later versions um, uh, in the, the first decade of the 21st century seeing the Roman Empire as, as an empire that can't be trusted, that has overreached itself. Mm-hmm. You know, a very clear analogy for some, perhaps for the United States. So that even the message sent by an artwork at a particular time isn't the one that a later group will actually read into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because for me, Zulu will always be uh, Welsh so- soldiers singing Men of Harlech. Mm-hmm. And I, even though I recognise historically that is incorrect, uh, that so dominates uh, dominates my thinking. There's a wonderful mm-hmm. British war movie of the 1950s that uh, one of our authors uh, authors deals with called The Dam Busters, about the, the raid on the German dams in 1943 mm-hmm. uh, by... Uh, um, uh, a, a squadron, it really was a mixed uh, empire squadron, there were Australians involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I read about that raid, I picture the movie. Michael Redgrave played Wallace Barnes, who was the designer of the bouncing bomb. And whenever I read about Barnes Wallace, it's not the picture of Barnes Wallace I have in my mind, mm-hmm. it's the actor Michael Redgrave. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's that um, that blurring between the cultural artefacts that introduced me uh, to that raid mm-hmm. and the, the actual event uh, event itself. Mm-hmm. So you might have touched on this already, and, and in fact you did touch on it a little. Um, how much do you have in there that's uh, sort of art or um, artistic endeavors aimed at children, you know, like children's books, illustrated books, or... Um, or even more, more modern, as you mentioned, the Marvel comics, movies, um, anything like that. How much of that is in there? If well, the any. one uh, in particular is uh, there is a chapter uh, on children's picture books, on Australian children's picture books, mm, okay. uh, written by by Margaret uh, K. Eyre and Nathan Lowen and uh, me. Mm-hmm. So uh, just to put myself last there, uh, it looks at the way Australian picture books have engaged with the First World War, and they're called modern picture books. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially, though they're called modern picture books, and they're, they're the ones we looked at were released uh, over the last few years, either during the centenary of World War One or in the lead-up to it. Mm-hmm. But when we actually looked at modern picture books, they were almost invariably written either by pacifists or... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, or people who would have a less than welcoming, you know, traditionally a less than welcoming view of an exploration of military history. And the books are beautiful, the artwork's are beautiful. But when you read them, thematically, they are entirely consistent with the, the canon of Australian war literature. Mm. They explore the same themes, they come to the same conclusions, uh, they are essentially a distilling of Australian war literature for children. Mm-hmm. They become not an interrogation of the mythology or an interrogation of the rhetoric. They become a children's version of it. And when you read the backgrounds of the authors and the artists, uh, though that clearly is not their intent, in effect that's what they become. They celebrate the courage of the, um, the average Australian soldier. The landing on Gallipoli is this um, great moment or a tragic moment mm. in, in Australian history. Even one called, and the band played Waltzing Matilda, which is based on one of the most famous ballads in Australian history. It was written in 1971 mm. and it's pervaded by a Vietnam sensibility. Even it 
which is um, essentially anti-war, when you read it, it might be anti the war, but it's pro the rest of, of the mythology surrounding it. Mm-hmm. And, and interestingly enough, uh, the children's picture book authors and illustrators who write on refugees have um, unintentionally adopted the same rhetoric. Mm-hmm. So it's a pro acceptance of refugee rhetoric going on, but the way they even break the narrative up. Whereas, uh, for example, the, the, the First World War children's picture books go, uh, pre-war Australia, you know, where, where, where one of the protagonists lives the free life of a rover, they join up, they train, they're exposed to the reality of warfare, and they come home uh, wounded or maimed uh, from that experience, questioning the experience itself. Mm-hmm. The refugee narratives begin with uh, life in their country, escape, the courage shown in the journey and the eventual arrive in Australia, they follow very much the same pattern. And that's what that article, uh, that, that particular chapter explores. Mm-hmm. The way that the, the, the rhetoric is so pervasive in the Australian imagination that probably unintentionally the authors have said, well, look, um, refugees are this frightening other uh, you know, separate from the Australian sense of, of national identity, mm-hmm. but they are Australian not by blood, but by character. Mm-hmm. That they've shown the same courage and resilience in the face of adversity, not of their making, that the Australian troops did. And in fact, the very title of the chapter, um, of that section of it, is Australians not by blood, but by, um, but by character, mm-hmm. uh, stems from a book I read some years ago, uh, about the French Foreign Legion, when uh, visiting uh, dignitaries or, or generals would, would learn not to say to a, a, a legionnaire, what country are you from, because they would say, my country is the legion. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was that they were French, not by blood given, not by blood received, but by blood given. Mm-hmm. So even my interpretation or, or the, our interpretation of other people's interpretation is seen through the prism of um, a seemingly unconnected idea such as uh, the French Foreign Legion, where you have quite literally um, foreigners Mm -hmm. uh, fighting for France. Mm -hmm. Margaret, do you have anything to add? Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, um, the, the picture books that we looked at, there was actually one that we used, that we did, um, hmm. for one of the grants, hmm. and it was a little bit different because we actually included historical quotes to move the narrative along, hmm. which we thought was a really good way for children to really understand an authentic voice from history, hmm. and it, it, it tried not to follow the format of what Martin was just talking about, but we, we just thought it was a really interesting approach, hmm. and... Um, and we had it animated, so just a very short animation, but with the quotes coming up as well, so to cater for children, you know, multimodal learning and that sort of thing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one I was thinking, Martin, was the Great War Dundee computer simulation. Um, that chapter, I think, it, although not written for children, well, the handbook's not really written for children, but mm-hmm. the actual um, um, idea behind it is for children to come in and learn about what happened in Dundee and the soldiers who left and the names come up. They see the map of where they were fighting and they have some really personalised stories. And once again, done in a multimodal way to attract children in instead of saying, here you go, read this textbook, read a chapter on Dundee and what happened. Yes, so, uh, Ian Donald did some uh, really interesting work looking at games and digital technology. So certainly that's something mm-hmm. uh, that... Um, would target, if not children, certainly because obviously games um, and digital technology technology isn't just about, you know, uh, students skipping school in a, in a video game parlour anymore. I mean, that's, that's last generation's view or the one before it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly there's those two or three chapters that look uh, specifically or, or at least are a little bit more um, geared toward an understanding of that world. And, and the textbook one by Susan Santoli at the University of South Alabama Mm-hmm. Uh, is a fascinating one as well because they say journalism is the first draft of history, but uh, I think uh, textbooks are a very, very close second 
Mm -hmm. um, particularly when, and interestingly in that chapter, the Russian textbook was almost superior to the, to the American one for a very short time, right up until the point the author got banned, the book, and the author got banned um, by Vladimir Putin. Hmm. Um, showing, Just a little too accurate. <laughs> well, he viewed the teaching of history the way many government officials do, even in Australia they've said the same thing, that uh, the teaching of history should uh, develop a, a sense of national identity and cohesion and pride in their country's history. So hmm. I don't want to be seen taking Vladimir Putin's side in an argument, um, unless he's listening, all hail Putin. Uh, but, um, you know, in that sense, his view was, was not entirely different from, say, the American book's view, hmm. except that it was taken to a, a natural extreme, because he, I suppose, leads a society with a, a less ingrained sense of, of the right to, to free speech than, than the US or, or Australia or, or, or Britain, for that matter. Um, and interestingly, in the children's picture book we did, we tried to balance those views with the use of historical uh, quotes drawn from the time so students could understand that, there's a, that there was some difference. Uh, one of the images that, that Margaret did uh, was very, had a very, and I don't think she intended this as the artist, she might have, uh, a, a very uh, strong religious symbolism. And, mm. and I'm not sure if she intentionally explored it. It shows an Australian soldier on the on the cliffs of Gallipoli with head bowed over the grave of a comrade with the dawn in the background. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a famous photograph. Uh, it's not based on, it was at least a little bit inspired by mm -hmm. a famous photograph. Uh, for Australians, even though we're an increasingly secular nation, where we're not as uh, even overtly religious as, as people in the US, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, Anzac Day's become almost an all souls day. There's a very mm -hmm. strong um, religious... Uh, symbolism that, that pervades Anzac Day, e even though it is not in and of itself a religious event, mm. it's become um, uh, uh, religious almost in spite of itself. The iconography, uh, uh, the, the the rhetoric, uh, even the use of the dawn there, where it where it becomes almost a resurrection, mm. where though the soldier may not um, be promised immort uh, immortality. There's a sense that um, there's an immortality of sorts mm -hmm. because he remains one of the glorious dead and the, the whole lest we forget uh, idea. Um, so it's, yeah. it's it's a fascinating look at the, at the place of it. And you'd be better placed to tell us the way um, the U.S. views the, the the Revolutionary War and the um, and of course the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. But because we became a nation peace, peacefully. Um, there was that sense that there, at least in 1914, that there'd been no blood sacrifice, right. that somehow we got our freedom a little bit on the cheap, and there was almost this desperation to to prove ourselves. That's why if you um, if you said to us, you know, you'd visited Australia, the first thing we'd say is, what did you think of it? Hmm. You know, there's that sense uh, of a smaller nation that that when those opportunities to come to stride the world stage. Yeah. Uh, we grab them. That's why one of the some of the legendary moments at the the Treaty of Versailles at the conference was when the Australian Prime Minister uh, William Morris Hughes and your Woodrow Wilson went for each other. They absolutely hated each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Wilson called um, our Prime Minister a, a varmint, and um, and uh, William Morris Hughes certainly uh, was was no less critical of Woodrow Wilson. So. That's part of our mythology as well, and it, it just is blurred with the experience on the battlefield that an Australian Prime Minister argued it out. And at one point, Woodrow Wilson said something to William Morris Hughes along the lines of, so the whole world has to bow to you, and you know, to the Australians. Mm. And uh, our Prime Minister said, that's about, uh, that's about right. Mm. And um, that's, that's... Now, Hughes had his flaws. They were gargantuan flaws. Hmm. But there, there's something about an Australian Prime Minister doing that that we can't help but but just be a little bit a uh, little bit impressed by. He was Welsh born as well, so so that just adds another another layer to to the legend. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what part of the research or or what part of the the editing work uh, was most enjoyable for each of you? 
Oh, learning new th- about new events and new places, and um, and actually having the email exchanges with the authors. So you know when you're reading through and, and just wanting to clarify something, and, and just that back and forth, and and seeing how passionate they were, because a lot of these are based on um, either doctorates or, or, or you know people that it's been their passion since they were thirteen, and you know it, it's that was for me. I learned so much and making those connections connections about why things had happened and particularly there's such a, a link between history and art you know because art tells stories visually in history you know in a written form normally um, just to see how that all came together and and really I think sometimes in the arts we can forget this seriousness of what's happened you know I, I think a lot of people see some contemporary art and go What's that about? Like, really? What are you doing? But but to actually see artists who are so passionate about um, helping people to re- remember, helping to commemorate in really sensitive and and um, resonant ways, I, I think I, I just found that such a joy to work through the through the chapters. It was it was really wonderful. Um, yeah. So sorry, I'll pass over to Martin. Uh, yes, it, uh, I really enjoyed dealing with, um, you, you'd get up in the morning and you'd come down and there'd be an email from Wales and you'd deal with it and there'd be an email from Scotland and then there'd be one from, from England and there'd be one from the US. And uh, I really enjoyed that because it, at least with emails there's no accents. So I, I hope to meet some of the, Wel- <laughs> some of the Welsh and, and Scot uh, contributors. And, uh, as Australians, we pride ourselves on being the only uh, English-speaking nation in the world that doesn't have an accent. Mm-hmm. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, to meeting some of the Scots and the Welsh and then and just putting a, a voice uh, with the name. Mm-hmm. But certainly, it, it's been an enjoyable experience and, and understanding, of course, that even though World War I might dominate our thinking in Australia, that there were it was a world war. And in the great scheme of things, though our contributions seem enormous, uh, particularly uh, on Gallipoli and the Western Front in 1918, where Australia, the Australian soldiers did punch a bit above their weight, uh, that nevertheless, when we were on Gallipoli, we were with the French and the English and the Indians uh, and the New Zealanders, of course, and, and the Turks were there as well. Uh, and, of course, in those great battles at the end of, um, at the, end of the war in 1918, uh, that in fact, the, and I'll give the Brits credit here, I mean, they all but bankrupted themselves. Uh, but for them, of course, I think the Battle of Britain might uh, might be their, their moment from the 20th century where they, they stood form, firm against the Nazis when, when things looked pretty uh, pretty bad. Mm-hmm. We were allied with them at the time, so all was, was never quite lost. Mm-hmm. But uh, certainly enjoyed that experience. Um, and working with academics from around the world was, yeah, it was just lovely. And they... And, and certainly there's a few there that are early career academics. I know uh, Natasha from the University of Kent and, and Daniel Maddock uh, here in, in um, Brisbane with, U, with USQ. Uh, to see them get one of their, not their first publications, but an early publication out there, uh, I feel I've put back in and, and put back into a system that, that at one point helped me, you know, when I was first looking to publish. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, actually approaching very well-known people in their fields and having them say, of course, I'd love to be involved. The generosity of those people mm-hmm. and their expertise and experience um, involved in the book was such a treat as well. When people agree to write in a book that you're editing uh, and you've got their book on your shelf, I know Paul Goff, if he, if he hears this, um, I was thinking I'd have to write something about a... Uh, official war art, and I thought, well, I'll start with Paul Goff's book, mm. and then I'll just have to spend four months just trying to immerse myself, and then Paul Goff said he'd contribute a chapter, and I thought, <laughs> well, I'll put that book to the back of the shelf, because uh, <laughs> the horse's mouth has, has arrived. So, so Paul, if you're listening, thank you very much. That was quite a thrill, and I did pay retail for your book. So, um, just to, to reassure you there, I didn't take it from the library. I actually paid for it. <laughs> What did each of you find by the end that was most surprising? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to think what surprised me uh, the most. Um, uh, I think uh, the different approaches to the conflicts, because uh, I've used the word pervasive a lot. Um, mm. No matter how widely you read, and, and, and I know Margaret's very widely travelled as well, 
uh, to understand that they're you, you know it intellectually that people view the same event differently and no one's lying it's it's you come from it from a different point of view a different experience um, a, a whole range of things shape the way we view things and 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 to read the say the Geffen's article about the Welsh uh, response in in churches to to memorialising the conflict and then putting that beside our study of, of Australian war memorials mm-hmm. and then looking for the differences and similarities and, and to understand that where I go, gee, Australians, we lost 60,000 dead, you know, across four years. It's our seminal moment. It's our foundation story. And to be reminded again that the Brits lost 20,000 in a single day, that in, in August 1914 on the I think in the, the 20 something of August 1907, uh, 1914, the French lost 27,000 dead in a single day. And uh, I'm conscious we were a smaller population, but when you understand the French experience, maybe during World War II, uh, where we see um, a French capitulation in 1940, uh, but to understand that, one really has to understand what impact on a society that 27,000 dead in a single day actually means to the fabric of a society. Mm. And the fact that the French army, though it mutinied in 1917, was still in the field in 1918. Mm -hmm. And that despite dreadful casualties, uh, the British Empire stood firm. Mm. Uh, And in fact, that when you have monarchies collapsing, you have the German monarchy gone, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the Austro-Hungarian Empire you know, literally shot to bits as well. Mm-hmm. But the British Empire, uh, the British royal family is still there. Well, some people may see that as a, a good or a bad thing. Um, most of uh, uh, my colleagues are Republicans. I'm a monarchist, mm-hmm. so I see it as a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I suspect that um, many of my colleagues are at best in, indifferent. Mm-hmm. But Margaret, what was your, your great surprise? Oh, my great surprise was... Um that idea, the concept of official war art and what what is sanctioned and what isn't sanctioned and when you start to read all the correspondence around that and how nations wanted to portray themselves. But on a contemporary note in terms of that, I was really surprised reading Charles and Lyndall's chapter about being official war artists in um, 2007 and eight, and the reception that they've had in the art world about doing that that somehow that's seen as something lesser, that they've sold out, you know, mm. that they actually went and did something on the war. I just found that really kind of disturbing. Um, but really interesting, I mean, they brought their own vision to that. They, they created artwork, you know, in a combat area. Like, I just, I, I think that should be, I would celebrate that. I think that's an amazing achievement, especially with the tradition of the official war artists that we've had. But on that note too, I was surprised that the Australian War Memorial had suspended the program for a while. So Mm. I'm not sure how that all links together. Oh, well, I do have a bit more of an idea now because of what they've said. But Mm. yeah, I I think they they do feel, um, you know, disturbed by that experience, by what had happened, by the reception that, that perhaps their work had received afterwards. Which it, and it seems that that may be something that's also impacted on other war artists when you when you read their accounts. I just find that really interesting, because we do have another war artist who has been doing other things, and and that kind of issue of him being a war artist comes up every now and again. So I'm not sure if it's the same in the US, Chris, with official war artists there, or or if that's something seen I differently. Um, I don't know. I. I... I think, I think artists in the U.S. are just happy for their colleagues if they have, uh, you know, steady work or anything like that. I don't think it's, yeah, I'm not sure, but that's sort of what what pops into my mind. Yeah. It's because I think people view um, official war art as propaganda, where in fact Charles and Lindell were anything but but given to, to propaganda. I think it just harkens back to Basil Liddell Hart's view that uh, when you put official and history together, the official tends to have a negative impact on the on the history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like 
we were talking about the word propaganda and the way it's used now and the way it was originally used. It, it's mm. interesting. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that surprised Margaret, perhaps, is that though she did as much work as I did, somehow I've contrived to speak for three quarters of the time. <laughs> she was completely honest. She, no, probably no, 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 you're the history person. No, no, that's fine. I think the other thing that surprised me was how long this all takes. Like, it's this has been a number of years now getting to this point, and it's just amazing. Like, we've been proofreading, and, and it, you've re you read something ten times, and you still pick something up. Just go, how? How is that possible? Mm-hmm. But, but we just want to make sure it's absolutely perfect. And Palgrave Macmillan have been fantastic to work okay. with. Uh, if I can send out a little advert for them, they have been professional, supportive. Um, it's just been a, a wonderful experience. Mm. Yes, and excellent reviewers. And we don't know who the reviewers were, but we'd like to thank our international reviewers for the proposal. Mm. Their feedback was amazing and, and so helpful in, in shaping the direction of the book. They were so expert. If I had their name, I think I'd have invited them to write a chapter because they uh, they had a very broad and a very deep knowledge, which, which was just refreshing. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a, a very difficult issue um, to come to a conclusion on in the book that maybe you'd like to see future research done? Um, if that makes sense? I think what we found was that, um, for example, if, if you and I decided we'd do a book or the book on the same topic, we could legitimately come up with 30 different chapters yet have a, a book that's uh, as equally uh, appropriate mm -hmm. because the, the breadth of artistic and cultural responses is, is obviously enormous. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't look at any of those chapters and think, gee, if that one fell out, the book would collapse. Mm. Now, I, I wouldn't have wanted to have um, attempted this book without, say, some chapters on the war on terror, because mm. it would have seemed obsolete before it even went to press. Mm. But we have a, a number of excellent chapters on the war on terror, but any one of them could have stepped out, mm. and this is not to belittle the, the contribution of the individual authors, mm. and we could have brought someone in. Mm. Uh, we're looking at doing some work on uh, cultural and artistic responses to war from Africa uh, and South America mm. and, and the continent of Europe. And now that England is well, now that Britain's no longer part of Europe, mm. uh, we'll, we can we'll call it Europe now. Mm. Uh, we're looking at that, and it's it's the same again. There's just such enormous breadth. So it's more about I think covering particular conflicts. So I look at the chapters, and I don't. Um, I don't think, oh, gee, that's a massive gap. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'd like to have covered something more uh, directly on the Holocaust, although it does come up in one of the chapters. Mm -hmm. But um, we're certainly going to um, to plug that gap uh, in later publications. We, we had uh, a chapter on the Holocaust lined up, uh, and certainly it informs some of the chapters, but that would be something I'd like to, to look at, because having visited Israel and, and the Holocaust museums there, mm -hmm. Um, the one in particular was just, you know, I think it depressed me for weeks, it, but, but it was a, a moving moment. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd certainly like to get something of that experience. And I'd like something from the modern Middle East as well, mm -hmm. I think, in later publications, because um, certainly that dominates dominates our thinking. And then the Holocaust, of course, though it has repercussions to the present day, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, certainly I'd like to look at... Uh, uh, at getting an Israeli author on board, I think that would be very interesting. Or, or two very different Israeli authors, um, and and see their view of, of the Middle East. And of course, well, we'd we'd obviously like to to get someone from from um, from elsewhere in the Middle East as well to, to to give us another view, because of course what we found was you'd get mention of wars. We go the Iraq Iran war. So you're talking about a you know, a devastating conflict between Iraq and Iran. Mm -hmm. But I, I couldn't name a, a battle or a major experience from it. I know it went on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know a few bits and pieces. Right. Uh, but but it becomes perhaps like the Spanish Civil War has become, where we acknowledge its importance, but it doesn't dominate history courses at school, for instance. We see it as mm -hmm. merely a lead-up, you know, a... a a prequel to World War Two, and of course it was it was far far more than that. Right. So yeah, there are certainly gaps I'd like to plug. But that said, 
even if I plug those five gaps right now, we could sit here and talk about what other gaps appear. Mm -hmm. Uh, Beautifully, it it gives me a chance to edit more books and write more chapters. And you should write a chapter if you're interested. (laughs) (laughs) I was just thinking, Mark, when you're talking about the Holocaust Memorial, I think you might have been referring to the sculptures you walk in with all the shoes. Yeah, there's a really so again the arts they're so evocative. You walk and you see that the people who own the shoes aren't there anymore. You know, it's that sense of absence. But I think that's why I really was interested in this book because the tension I talked about with Lyndall and Charles in terms of bringing art and history and then war together in a book, I think is something really exciting. Mm. And um, and I think it is addressing a gap there as well. So yeah. Mm. So you've touched on on this question in various ways, but what do the two of you hope the book will do? Uh, At a basic level, and and this is not an academic or a professional hope, I hope that anyone with with an interest in history can sit down with it, open it up and say, look at a a chapter um, and say, oh, gee, chapter, I'm chapter 30. So I'll use 30 as an example. So uh, if they open up Chapter 30 randomly and go, oh, that topic doesn't really interest me, that they could go to Chapter 29 and say, oh, that's really interesting, or go to Chapter 10 and say, oh, I love that part of history, I'll read it, or go to Chapter 13, oh, sorry, 13 is one I wrote too, I'll pick another, <laughs> go to Chapter 15, uh, rewriting World War II, uh, the, the, the textbook chapter where they go, I'd never thought about that, and I know nothing about that, but mm. that would be interesting to read. I like the idea that you can sit down with a book and pick a chapter at random mm. and go, that's interesting. So that's that's my hope for it as a general work. Uh, and I'll pass to my colleague, Margaret. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Um, well, as an educator, I'm very concerned about the, the emphasis on literacy and numeracy. It, it's really important, I'm not saying it's not, but it has really predominated in our curriculum. We've gone to a national curriculum and um, and there's external benchmarking and then schools' results are put up and then you know schools are judged and teachers are judged on how well their students have done. And um, and I just think there was there has been so much work done in showing how the arts engage children in their learning, children and young people. So if you integrate the arts into history and into English and places like that, into curriculum areas, children are much more engaged because they're learning in different ways. So I'd really like through this book for people to see how the arts do engage people in learning. So like the Great War Dundee Project, how children can be engaged by that and how how communities come together with symbols. So like the War Memorials chapter. War Memorials are an amazing uh, thing for people to see and and to concentrate and focus on because they represent symbolically what's happened. So for people to see that the arts are an integrated part of our lives, that they have been there the whole time and that that they they do have that resonance for people. Even though the war mightn't have happened just then, they do remind us, they do help us to remember what's happened and why we, why we should be so thankful to the people who have given up their lives for us in those, in those terrible conflicts that have happened. Mm-hmm. So what, uh, what's the next editing or writing project for each of you, or any project, any kind of project? <laughs> Well, you go oh, first, Martin. Let me okay. see. <laughs> I, I tried to, to say ladies first then. Uh, at, at, uh, at this level, we're working on um, uh, with Palgrave Macmillan over lo- looking at European responses to, to conflict uh, yeah. in the 20th century. Uh, and at the moment, we're, uh, Margaret's a, a practicing artist as well. Mm. So we've just done a, uh, I curated, and Mark was one of the, um, was one of the artists, curated a show at the Toowoomba Regional Art Gallery. Uh, looking at the photography of Frank Hurley, uh, who's a famous Australian war uh, photographer. And what we did, we, we gathered a team of eight artists together. We're great believers in collaboration. Uh, gathered eight artists together, and they uh, chose uh, an image from Frank Hurley uh, from the Western Front in 1917 or the Middle East in 1918 and responded to it artistically. So they didn't copy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they responded to it uh, using uh, various media. Uh, 
uh, and that show hopefully is going to be a touring exhibition through Queensland, and uh, which is the state we're in, mm-hmm. um, which is the um, the best state to live in if you're uh, for our Australian listeners. Uh, and we're hoping to tour it through regional Queensland, like Miami. And, <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, Miami's, uh, as Marg would note, because we've been there as a city. Uh, she's talking about Florida, the great state of Florida. Oh, sorry. Which I think, does it, it's not the one with the English flag on its state flag? That's not Florida? Uh, you know what, I, I I don't know the Florida flag offhand. I, I know it a little, but I don't know it specifically that detailed. There, there is an American state flag, I think, that has the Union Jack on it. And shame on you for not knowing. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, so we're looking to both pursue the academic side with Palgrave. We're also looking to um, to engage artistically. So we hope to, to build up our credibility as artists and curators here in Australia mm-hmm. and then hopefully look at something in the US or the UK or Europe, mm-hmm. um, looking particularly uh, at landscape and the way landscape is, is central to, to a nation, which is a, a construct of the mind, of course, a nation. Mm-hmm. but to a nation's sense of self. And that's why uh, landscapes are so important. And you see those wonderful landscapes in the Met mm-hmm. uh, that are just uh, quite superb. So uh, th- that's where we're headed, uh, like two arms of the same the same journey, I suppose. One, the academic on the right, mm-hmm. and then the arts on the left. But, of course, not parallel journeys, um, journeys that, that, that link. Mm-hmm. But I'll pass to, to Margaret. <laughs> well, I'm working on a few grant applications for the touring exhibition, so see how that gets picked up. And I've also, um, we had two wonderful veterans featured in one of the artworks in the exhibition we just did. One's World War Two, and he's 96, mm. and the other's a Vietnam veteran. And Anne Smith, the photographer, um, used composite images of Frank Hurley, so the whole exhibition was based on Frank Hurley's iconic images. Mm. And we've had a lot of media interest, and George and Ian travel all the way from Proserpine to Toowoomba, so nine hours away for the opening. And we had dignitaries and our RSL, which is the Return Services League representatives and the minister. And, and it was a really big deal. So it looks like there's been a lot of interest. So we're just trying to organise that maybe to go down to Canberra, which to sit for the politicians to have a look at as well, mm. which would be great. And I'm also working on a few articles. I'm president of Art Education Australia as well, so mm. we're um, looking at a special theme issue at the moment of our journal, so lots to keep me busy. And I'm uh, working at the State Library of Queensland at the moment. I won a fellowship uh, for a year, and that's partly based on the success of the Palgrave book. So for a year I'm researching the Queenslander imagining of the conflict. So a bit of a shout-out there to the State Library. Mm-hmm. But the, the Frank Hurley photographs that we used, just to, to get back to that for a moment, to show how impactful artistic responses are, uh, when Australians think of World War One or try to picture it or imagine it, they invariably come up with Hurley's images. Mm-hmm. And uh, interestingly, his images of 1917, he was there during the Third Battle of Ypres at the end of 1917, that's how Australians picture the Western Front. But interestingly, 1917 is, is almost on the periphery of Australian military history. It's the year in between. Hmm. They had the birth of a nation on Gallipoli in 1915. They had the baptism of fire on the Western Front on the Somme in 1916. We had our contribution to the final victories in 1918, and particularly fighting at a French town called Villers Bretno where the school still has painted in big colours in the quadrangle, um, never forget Australia. Hmm. Uh, so conscious are they of, of the link between us and that village. But 1917 can't claim that. It wasn't a baptism of fire. It wasn't the final victories. It, it became almost this suffering in the, in the mud uh, and the quagmire that, that was Belgium in late 1917. Hmm. But people use Hurley's images as uh, as the go-to. This is what World War I was like for, for the Australian soldiers. Hmm. And we sent 330,000 soldiers overseas and 60,000 of them were killed hmm. uh, and double that number were wounded. And I know the, uh, the Americans, I think, declared war in April 1917 and were making their presence felt into 1918. Hmm. But I, I don't believe it's had an impact on American thinking the way it has for us. You have had other conflicts there's no day of infamy 
for Americans in World War One. There's no uh, Gettysburg. Um, not to denigrate their experience, but um, uh, the American experience of World War One would be as much about the influenza pandemic. Mm. I think half the American soldiers who died in World War One died of influenza. Mm. Uh, but but certainly American involvement marked the, the decline of Europe, or, or was that great moment when it was clear that the old world needed the new world to, to bring a war to a close. So, mm. um, not denigrating the American experience, but you, I think your identity is drawn from other conflicts. Yeah. Um, whereas for us, uh, World War One remains central, and there are a lot of academics out there interrogating that and, and looking to, to 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 move beyond the mythology. Mm. But it's it is pervasive. Yeah, you barely know World War One happened um, here in the U.S. It's uh, among the general public. Um, the closest I think oh, really? we get to it is is maybe character. Uh, you know, stuff said in the 1920s has been uh, pretty popular in the last few years, and the closest oh, we get to World War One is is vets in these shows or whatever. You know, people who experienced it. They they focus more on like how it it broke people. You know, how it messed them up. But as far as the actual, oh. you know, the combat or battles, it's barely recognize it's depressing to me but oh. yeah but oh, well, chris can i oh sorry mum can i just ask chris did, um janet mcdonald did a fantastic chapter on war horse mm -hmm. did that and it toured through the u.s was there did that kind of raise any awareness or it was just she, it, oh. it was just another movie people enjoyed it or not it was just came and went just like any other movie it's like okay oh this is the theater adaption of it where they yeah. actually have the structures of the horse on stage and oh. people are moving yeah. oh yeah i it's yeah i mean i follow this stuff and and even even world war Two interest is waning you know like even pearl harbor has is in the last few years after the 75th it's like people are just not barely paying attention anymore Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, oh, it's... it's well, a... <laughs> I suppose well greatest... good for you, Chris. Good for you and your program. I suppose the greatest generation now is, is, is coming to an end. Uh, hmm. uh, I mean, the youngest veterans must be in their 90s by now. Mm -hmm. And right. you've, got, you've got American presidents who, who now haven't served in the military. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had George Bush who actually flew combat missions, mm -hmm. and what was Bill Clinton might have been the first American president not to have served in the military, or? Uh, I don't know offhand. I don't want to answer because I'd have to think for a second, but uh, I don't want to take the time to think at the uh, moment. I, I know Nixon was, was Navy, certainly, and, yeah. and Kennedy was in the patrol boats. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, and, and uh, oh, Reagan, no, he went to war in the movies, but, um, yeah. but certainly, like, yeah, it's, it's a different generation now, of course. Though, though I will... I will caveat it to say that even though specific battles and such aren't aren't a big deal, young people are really into the imagery of World War Two and World World War One through games and like steampunk. I don't know if you're familiar with that. People like to yes. so it's it's weird that it's not necessarily being forgot it's it's being forgotten as, as a historical event, but it's being remembered as sort of a cool thing that people still like to learn about. So it's kind of a weird... I'm still trying to figure out what it means, the way people, you know, the younger generation is approaching it. But I see the Civil War with the reenactments, the, the big uh, the big uh, commemoration of Gettysburg mm -hmm. a couple of years ago where they, they turn up and reenact on the battlefield. Like our perception is um, that uh, the Civil War is... is still got a hold on the national imagination no i've talked to civil war authors they say it's 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 minuscule compared to what it used to be you still see the reenactors but as one as one uh person put it civil war used to have a whole rack on, at bookstores and now it's maybe books are included in a u.s history section oh okay uh, so just picking up on what chris said about symbolism and the young people mike um Armstrong was talking to me at the opening and he said that um, because I had created a, an artwork that had the Crusader cross on it and he said, oh, Mark, 
talk me through this because I was looking at the Battle of Jerusalem. So my photograph was the 1917 Battle of Jerusalem by Frank Hurley. And he said, because there's some symbols in the Australian Army where they're actually banning them. They're finding that they're not being used in the right way. They're being used to kind of <laughs> incite all sorts of things. But what they argued was it was more bonding for the groups that were using these particular symbols and things. So, Like death's heads and, and things like that. And, yeah. Yeah, so a, the Australian a, Army came out and said, no more. <laughs> yeah. But there's some in the Australian War Memorial, so there's a bit of a mixed message. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think part of, part in the U.S. at least, part of it is that um, such a small number of people are in the military or know people in the military or are related people in, in to yeah. people in the military. Uh, I think people are losing uh, a sense of, of military history. So, but again, the get the video games. You know, they still have the video games that people are into. So I'm still trying to figure out what it means. You know, like the Assassin's Creed gets into the American Revolution, medieval warfare. Um, you have all the World War Two, you know, video game shooters. So it's 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 changing. It's the, the way it's consumed. And Lincoln was a um, was a zombie hunter, <laughs> vampire <laughs> vampire <laughs> hunter. <laughs> Vampire hunter. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I should get my history correct. It yeah. Wasn't zombies, and vampires. See, I, I don't know much about that period of history. I should read more. <laughs> but look, thank you very much for the chat. We've really enjoyed this. So I, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. I want to ask: Is there a website or social media that either of you have um, that people can follow uh, your work and thoughts and whatnot? Actually, no. But we'll rectify that. We'll re rectify that. We'll have to embrace the, the 21st century. Hmm. Okay. Um, any last words? That's all I have. Oh, okay. Look, thank you very much. It was a lovely experience. It's uh, it, As much as anything else, it's great to sit and talk history with someone. Oh, yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah, someone who's passionate about it. It's wonderful. Yeah. And, Chris, thanks so much for your interest in it. We really appreciate it. The book should be published in October. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um well, thank you. And it's on the Palgrave oh. side, and oh, and they all have Twitters and all sorts of things happening there, and our university will as well. So we'd just like to thank the University of Southern Queensland too for all their wonderful support and giving us time to, to work on the book. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening. One of the best ways to provide feedback on this podcast is to rate it on iTunes. Please let me know if you liked it. Or give me a poor rating if you didn't like this podcast, and I can use that feedback to hopefully get better. Otherwise, please follow me on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar, on YouTube under War Scholar 1945, on Twitter at War Scholar, on Facebook under War Scholar, and you can find more information on my website warscholar.org please remember my name chris does not have an h so it's c r i s a l v a r e z thank you and i hope you continue to enjoy this podcast